Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about communism, including something of its origins and impact, as well as an, in, as an aspect of this that is basically taboo in our society, the Jewish role in communism. The topic of communism is, of course, much more relevant to those who remember the years of the so-called Cold War rivalry of the United States and the Soviet Union, especially during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Every American who was alive and alert in October 1962, for example, remembers the tension of the Cuban Missile Crisis. When the world came its closest ever to the brink of nuclear war between the U.S. and the USSR. It's now been about 20 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe, and the end of the Soviet-led world communist movement. For young people who have grown up during these past 20 years, it may be difficult to understand just how important communism was during the 20th century, to understand the enormous power of the Soviet Union, especially during World War II, or the great influence and even appeal of the Marxist communist ideology for many millions around the world. In our society, we hear a lot about the evils of Hitler and Nazism and, of course, about the horrors of the Holocaust. But we hear far, far less about the legacy and impact of communism. For that reason, it may be difficult to understand the enormous cost in human life and in misery and suffering of communism during the 20th century. For rarely in history has a regime taken the lives of so many of its own people as did the Bolshevik regime of Lenin and Stalin. We've all heard the incessantly repeated six million figure of Holocaust victims. But the number of victims of Soviet communism is unquestionably much higher than the problematic Holocaust figure of six million. One scholar who has devoted years of study and research to this question is the distinguished British historian Robert Conquest. He's written extensively on Russia, Stalin, and the Soviet Union. His most important book is probably uh, the one entitled The Great Terror, a book that I recommend. In that book, Conquest writes, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that the post-1934 death toll in the Soviet Union was well over 10 million. To this should be added the victims of the 1930-1933 famine, the Kulak deportations, and other anti-peasant campaigns, amounting to another 10 million plus. The total, that is the total death toll of Soviet communism, is thus in the range of what the Russians now refer to as the 20 million. Other scholarly estimates of the death toll of Soviet communism have been less than that, and some have been higher. Olga Shatunovskaya was head of a special commission during the 1960s that had been appointed by Soviet Premier Khrushchev to look into the scope and scale of repression and killings during the Stalin years. Olga Shatinovskaya, in this regard, had access to important documents and papers held by uh, a Politburo member Anastas Mikoyan. <clears throat> she concluded that during a six-year period alone, that is from January 1st, 1935, to June 22, 1941, 19,840,000 enemies of the people, so-called enemies of the people, were arrested in the Soviet Union. Of this 19.8 million, 7 million, she says, were shot in prison, and a majority of the others died in camp. Now that's just uh, during this one six-year period. Another historian, Simon Sebog Montefiore, writes in his book Stalin, the Court of the Red Tsar, quote, 
Perhaps 20 million had been killed, 28 million deported, of whom 18 million had slaved in the gulags. One of the most <clears throat> important and influential Russian historians of recent decades is Dmitry Volkoganov, who was a general in the Soviet army and the author of several important books, including worthwhile biographies of Stalin and Lenin, books that I recommend. In one book, Autopsy for an Empire, historian Volkoganov writes, between 1929 and 1953, the Soviet the state created by Lenin and set in motion by Stalin deprived 21.5 million Soviet citizens of their lives. Another historian, Jonathan Brent, in his book Inside the Soviet Archives, Discovering the New Russia, writes, quote, Estimates on the number of Stalin's victims over his 25-year reign, from 1928 to 1953, vary widely, but 20 million is now considered the minimum. One of the most startling and influential books on this subject was uh, published in France and then later in the United States, and it's entitled The Black Book of Communism. It consists of a number of essays compiled and uh, edited by the French scholar Stéphane Courtois. Stéphane Courtois writes in his introduction, quote, Communist regimes turned mass crime into a full-blown system of government. He estimates, estimates the death toll of world communism at a staggering 94 million. Of that number, he estimates 20 million deaths of and by the Soviet Union and 65 million deaths of communist China. One of the most... Um, authoritative investigations of this question of the number of victims of Soviet communism has been carried out by Alexander Yakovlev, who for a time was a leading figure in the Soviet Communist Party and in the Soviet government. He was also a historian and the author of a book, A Century of Violence in Soviet Russia. In that book, he writes, quote, my own many years and experience in the rehabilitation of victims of political terror allow me to assert that the number of people in the USSR who were killed for political motives or who died in prisons and camps during the entire period of Soviet power totaled 20 to 25 million. And unquestionably, one must add those who died of famine, more than five and a half million during the Civil War and more than five million during the 1930s. Well, how is it possible that the Bolsheviks, who made up a small minority, but an active one, in, during World War I, were able to seize power in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, and then take control of Russia and impose on Russia a cruel and despotic regime. How is it that the followers of uh, Karl Marx were able to win over that level of ardent support and take power? Well, one person who has looked into this is the Jewish scholar Robert Wistrich, and he highlights the important role played by Jews in this process in Russia. Robert Wistrich is a professor of European and Jewish history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and is the number, uh, author of a number of books. He's also considered a leading scholar of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> In his book, Revolutionary Jews from Marx to Trotsky, Wistrich writes about the, what he calls the indisputable fact that Jews from the outset played a part out of all proportion to their numbers in the development of modern socialism. It is this fact which requires some explanation and analysis. He points out that Jews in 19th century Germany were the leaders of the early socialist movement. 
The first Jewish, uh, excuse me, German communist leader was Moses Hess. And of course, the creator of what is called scientific socialism and the founder of the international communist movement was Karl Marx. Karl Marx, along with Frederick Engels, is the author of the um, Communist Manifesto, one of the most influential works in 20th century or 19th and 20th century modern history. Karl Marx uh, was born in Western Germany but lived most of his life in Brussels, Paris, and then in London and was the author of many articles and uh, tracts and booklets and of his major work, Kapital. Das Kapital. Karl Marx was um, uh, uh, descended from a long line of rabbis on both his mother and father's side, although his father had uh, converted to Christianity uh, to help his career. And uh, so Karl Marx was uh, not raised as a Jewish re in the Jewish religion. Ferdinand LaSalle, another Jew in Germany, was the founder of the first German workers' organization and was the inspirer of German social democracy. Another important uh, Jewish leader was Rosa Luxemburg, who was the leader of the German and Polish left-wing socialists and one of the founders of the German Communist Party. In 1918, a Soviet government was set up for a short time in Munich, the capital of Bavaria. The uh, Bavarian Soviet Republic was headed by Kurt Eisner, uh, and as well as Gustav Landauer, Ernst Toller, and Eugen Levine, all of them Jews. Jews were also, ex of course, extremely prominent, as Wistrich points out, at the side of Lenin when the uh, October Revolution in 1917 brought them into power uh, and in establishing the Soviet, new Soviet regime. Apart from uh, Leon Trotsky, who planned and executed the armed insurrection. Other Jews included Sverdlov, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Radek, Joffe, Ryazanov, Uritsky, and Litvinov, who were leading figures in the Bolshevik party. Wistrich also points out that Jews were even more important, if that's possible, in the Menshevik faction of the Russian social democracy movement, and included such personalities as Paul Axelrod, Lev Deutsch, Martov, Lieber, Dan, and Abramovich. Wistrich uh, quotes a uh, neutral observer of the period, the sociolo sociolo sociologist Robert Michaels, who was commenting in a classic study on the European workers' movement before 1917, quote, in many countries, in Russia and Romania, for instance, but above all in Hungary and in Poland, the leadership of the working class parties is almost exclusively in the hands of Jews, as is plainly apparent from an examination of the personality of the delegates to the international congresses. Wistrich goes on to write, Jews have unquestionably unquestionably been a pioneering element, a ferment, and a catalyst within modern socialist and revolutionary movements. And he goes on to ask the question, but why did so many of them become involved in socialism? Well, one important explanation that has been uh, embraced by a number of historians, including uh, the great British historian uh, Arnold Toynbee, has been that uh, Marxism or communism is a secular vision or version of uh, Judaism. That uh, just as the Jewish religion sees history as going in a line that culminates in the return of the Messiah, and a utopian world is uh, and the creation of a utopian new order 
The Marxist secular version of that is that history will reach a final stage with the coming to power of the proletariat, which will usher in a new and final era of uh, utopian era of equality. Even though, as Wistrich points out, Marx was a Jew who had abandoned and did not embrace the faith of his uh, fathers and ancestors, the messianic expectation of Israel remained in his subconscious. And the subconscious, Wistrich points out, is always stronger than the conscious. The, um, for those who hold this view, the uh, proletariat is thus a kind of new Israel, God's chosen people, the liberator and builder of an earthly kingdom that is to come. His Marx's proletarian communism is thus a secularized form of the ancient Jewish Chileism. A chosen class takes the place of the chosen people. It was impossible to reach such a notion by means of science. It is an idea of a religious kind. Here we have the very morrow of the communist religion, for a messianic consciousness is surely always of ancient Hebrew origin. Well, this is the outlook of those who have seen communism as a secular version of Judaism. It's essentially a theological position which attributes the universalist messianism of Marxian socialism to an unconscious strain of Hebraic prophetism in its founder, Karl Marx. The Jewish component in Marxism become, becomes its struggle for the concrete realization of supposed social justice in this world and its vision of ultimate human redemption as the culmination of the historical process. Well, there's no question, as Wistrich and others have pointed out, of the important role played by Jews in the Bolshevik takeover of Russia in 1917. Jews were disproportionately represented even before 1917 in all of Russia's subversive leftist parties. Now, the Jewish hatred of the Tsarist regime in Russia had a certain basis in objective conditions. Of the leading European powers of the day, Imperial Russia was the most institutionally conservative and anti-Jewish. For example, Jews were normally not permitted to reside in Russia outside a large area in the west of the empire known as the Pale of Settlement. But however understandable, or perhaps even defensible, Jewish hostility toward the imperial Russian regime may have been, the remarkable Jewish role in the vastly more despotic Soviet regime is less easy to justify. One person who has studied and written on this is the Russian-born Jewish writer Sonia Margolina. In a book about Jews in Russia during the 20th century, Margolina writes that the Jewish role in supporting the Bolshevik regime is what she calls the historic sin of the Jews. Margolina points out, for example, the prominent role of Jews as commandants of Soviet gulag concentration and labor camps, and the role of Jewish communists in the systematic destruction of Russian churches. Moreover, she goes on, I'm quoting, the Jews of the entire world supported Soviet power and remained silent in the face of any criticism from the opposition. Well, although officially Jews have never made up more than 5% of the total population of Russia or the Soviet Union, they played a highly disproportionate and probably decisive role in the infant Bolshevik regime, effectively dominating the Soviet government during its early years. 
Soviet historians, along with most of their colleagues in the West, for decades preferred to ignore this subject. But the facts of this cannot be denied. With the notable exception of Lenin, whose born name was Vladimir Ulyanov, most of the leading communists who took control of Russia in the years 1917 to 1920 were Jews. Leon Trotsky, who was born Lev Bronstein, headed the Red Army and for a time was chief of the Soviet foreign affairs. Yakov Sverdlov, who was born Solomon, was both the Bolshevik Party's uh, executive secretary and, as chairman of the Central Executive Committee, head of the Soviet government. Grigory Zinoviev headed the Communist International, the Comintern, which was the central agency for spreading revolution in foreign countries. Other prominent Jews included Press Commissar Karl Radek, who was born Sobelson, Foreign Affairs Commissar Maxim Litvinov, whose born name was Wallach, Lev Kamenev, whose born name was Rosenfeld, and Moshe Uritsky. Lenin himself was of mostly Russian and Kalmuk ancestry, but he was also one quarter Jewish. His maternal grandfather, Israel Blank or Alexander Blank, was a Ukrainian Jew who was later baptized into the Russian Orthodox Church. Lenin was a thoroughgoing internationalist, and he viewed ethnic or cultural loyalties with contempt. He had little regard for his own uh, fellow Russian countrymen. He once remarked, an intelligent Russian is almost always a Jew or someone with Jewish blood in his veins, a remark that one can regard as a uh, one of self-flattery uh, or in the Soviet seizure of power in Russia, the Jewish role was probably critical. Two weeks prior to the Bolshevik October Revolution of 1917, Lenin convened a top-secret meeting in St. Petersburg, at which the key leaders of the Bolshevik Party's Central Committee made the fateful, fateful decision to seize power in a violent takeover. Of the twelve persons who took part in this decisive gathering, there were four Russians, including Lenin, one Georgian, Stalin, one Pole, Dzerzhinsky, and six Jews. That is, half of the members of this central uh, decisive meeting were Jewish. To direct the takeover of uh, Petrograd or Petersburg, a seven-man political bureau was chosen. This political bureau consisted of two Russians, Lenin and Buvnov, one Georgian, Stalin, and four Jews, Trotsky, Sokolnikov, Zinoviev, and Kalinyev. That is, a majority of the seven-man political bureau set up to direct the Bolshevik takeover in St. Petersburg were Jews. Well-informed observers, both inside and outside of Russia, took note at the time of the crucial Jewish role in Bolshevism. The U.S. ambassador to Russia during this period was uh, David Francis. In a dispatch written in January 1918 to Washington, Francis wrote, The Bolshevik leaders here, most of whom are Jews and 90% of whom are returned exiles, care little for Russia or any other country, but are internationalists, and they are trying to start a worldwide social revolution. The uh, American Hebrew, a leading American Jewish community paper in 1920 wrote, the Bolshevik Revolution was largely the product of Jewish thinking, Jewish discontent, Jewish effort to reconstruct. Well, we're taking a break at this point, and we'll return and welcome back. As I uh, mentioned when we went on break, well-informed observers, both in Russia and outside of Russia, noted at the time the crucial Jewish role in the uh, Bolshevik takeover of Russia. 
One of the most important observers, and authoritative, you might say, observers of this, was Winston Churchill, who was already a, a prominent uh, writer and politician in Britain during that period. Of course, Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of Britain during most of World War II. In an article published in the February 8, 1920 issue of the London Illustrated Sunday Herald, Churchill wrote that Bolshevism is, as he put it, a worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development, of envious malevolence, and impossible equality. In this article, Winston Churchill went on to write, quote, There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism and in the actual bringing about of the Russian Revolution by these international and, for the most part, atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one. It probably outweighs all others. With the notable exception of Lenin, the majority of the leading figures are Jews. Moreover, the principal inspiration and driving power comes from the Jewish leaders. Thus, Chicherin, a pure Russian, is eclipsed by his nominal subordinate, Litvinov, and the influence of Russians like Bukharin or Lunacharsky cannot be compared with the power of Trotsky or of Zinoviev, the dictator of the Red Citadel, or of Krasin or Radek, all Jews. In the Soviet institutions, the predominance of Jews is even more astonishing, and the prominent, if not indeed the principal part in the system of terrorism applied by the Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution, the Cheka, has been taken by Jews, and in some notable cases, by Jewesses. Needless to say, the most intense passions of revenge have been excited in the breasts of the Russian people. As an expression of its radically anti-nationalist character, the fledgling Soviet government issued a decree a few months after taking power that made anti-Semitism a crime in Russia. The new communist regime thus became the first in the world to severely punish all expressions of anti-Jewish sentiment. Soviet officials apparently regarded such measures as indispensable. Based on careful observation during a lengthy stay in Russia, the American Jewish scholar Frank Golder reported in 1925 that, quote, because so many of the Soviet leaders are Jews, anti-Semitism is gaining in Russia particularly in the army and among the old and new intelligentsia, who are being crowded for positions by the sons of Israel." Unquote. Summing up the situation at the time, Israeli historian Louis Rappaport has written, quote, Immediately after the Bolshevik Revolution, many Jews were euphoric over their high representation in the new government. Lenin's first Politburo was dominated by men of Jewish origins. Under Lenin, Jews became involved in all aspects of the revolution, including its dirtiest work. Despite the communist vows to eradicate anti-Semitism, it spread rapidly after the revolution, partly because of the prominence of so many Jews in the Soviet administration, as well as in the traumatic, inhuman Sovietization drives that followed. Historian Salo Baron has noted that an immensely disproportionate number of Jews joined the new Bolshevik secret police, the Cheka, and many of those who fell afoul of the Cheka would be shot by Jewish investigators. The collective leadership that emerged in Lenin's dying days was headed by the Jew Zinoviev, a loquacious, mean-spirited, curly-haired Adonis whose vanity knew no bounds." Unquote. Another Jewish historian, Leonard Shapiro, writes, Anyone who had the misfortune to fall into the hands of the Cheka stood a very good chance of finding himself confronted with and possibly shot by a Jewish investigator. Another historian, Bruce Lincoln, an American professor of Russian history, writes, In Ukraine, Jews made up nearly 80% of the rank-and-file Cheka agents. 
The Cheka, by the way, or known as the Vecheka, was the Soviet secret police that was later known as the GPU, OGPU, the NKVD, the NVD, and then finally during the Soviet period as the KGB. Well, in light of all of this, it should not be surprising that Yakov Yurovsky, the leader of the Bolshevik squad that carried out the murder of the Tsar and his family, was Jewish, as was Sverdlov, the Soviet chief who co-signed Lenin's execution order. One Russian who has written about this is a uh, mathematician of world stature, Igor Shafarevich. He sharply criticized the Jewish role in bringing down the Romanov monarchy and establishing communist rule in his country. Shafarevich was a leading dissident during the final decades of Soviet rule. He was also a prominent human rights activist who was a founding member of the Committee on the Defense of Human Rights in the USSR. In his book, Russophobia, Shafarevich noted that Jews were amazingly numerous among the personnel of the Bolshevik secret police. The characteristic Jewishness of the Bolshevik executioners, Shafarevich went on, is most conspicuous in the execution of the Emperor Nicholas II. Shafarevich writes, quote, This ritual action symbolized the end of centuries of Russian history, so that it can be compared only to the execution of Charles I in England or Louis XVI in France. It would seem that representatives of an insignificant ethnic minority should keep as far away as possible from this painful action, which would reverberate in all history. Yet, what names do we meet? The execution was personally overseen by Yakov Yurovsky, who shot the Tsar. The president of the local Soviet was Bela Borodov, born Weisbart, the person responsible for the general administration in Ekaterinburg, was Shaya Goloshchikin. And to round out the picture, on the wall of the room where the execution took place, was a distich from a poem by Heinrich Heine, written in German, about King Balthazar, who offended Jehovah and was killed for the offense." Unquote. A similarly harsh assessment of this execution of the uh, emperor and his family was provided by the British journalist Robert Wilton. In his 1920 book, he wrote, the whole record of Bolshevism in Russia is indelibly impressed with the stamp of alien invasion. The murder of the Tsar, deliberately planned by the Jew Sverdlov, who came to Russia as a paid agent of Germany and carried out by the Jews Goloshchikin, Siromolotov, Sarovov, Safarov, Voikov, and Yurovsky, is an act not of the Russian people, but of this hostile invader." Unquote. Well, to put the matter in perspective, it's important to realize that as important as and decisive as the Jewish role was in the Bolshevik takeover of Russia, in the struggle for power that followed Lenin's death in 1924, Joseph Stalin emerged victorious over his rivals and eventually succeeded in putting to death nearly every one of the most prominent early Bolshevik leaders, including Trotsky, Zinoviev, Radek, and Kamenev. With the passage of time, and particularly after 1928, the Jewish role in the top leadership of the Soviet state and its Communist Party diminished markedly. The killing of the Romanov family um, is symbolic uh, of the tragic fate of Russia and indeed of the entire West in the 20th century. The murder of the Tsar and his family is all the more deplorable because whatever his failings as a monarch, Nicholas II was by all accounts a personally decent, generous, humane, and honorable man. In view of the millions that would be put to death by the Soviet rulers in the years to follow, the murder of the Romanov family might not seem of great importance, and yet the event has deep symbolic meaning. 
In the apt words of Harvard University historian Richard Pipes, quote, The manner in which the massacre was prepared and carried out, at first denied and then justified, has something uniquely odious about it, something that radically distinguishes it from previous acts of regicide and brands it as a prelude to 20th century mass murder. On the night of July 16th to 17th, 1918, a squad of Bolshevik secret police murdered Russia's last emperor, Tsar Nicholas II, along with his wife, Tsaritsa Alexandra, their 14-year-old son, Tsarevich Alexis, and their four daughters. They were cut down in a hail of gunfire in a half-cellar room of the house in Ekaterinburg, a city in the Ural Mountain region where they had been held as prisoner. The daughters were finished off with bayonets. To prevent a cult for the dead, Tsar, the bodies were carted away to the countryside and hastily, hastily buried in a secret grave. Bolshevik authorities at first reported that the Romanov emperor had been shot after the discovery of a plot to liberate him. For some time, the deaths of the empress and the children were kept secret. Soviet historians claimed for many years that local, local Bolsheviks had acted on their own in carrying out the killings, and that Lenin, founder of the Soviet state, had nothing to do with the crime. The mass slaughter and chaos of the First World War and the revolutionary upheavals that swept Europe in 1917-1918 brought an end not only to the ancient Romanov dynasty in Russia, but to an entire continental social order. Swept away as well was the Hohenzollern dynasty in Germany with its stable constitutional monarchy and the ancient Habsburg dynasty of Austria-Hungary with its multinational Central European Empire. Europe's leading states up to that time shared not only the same Christian and Western cultural foundations, but most of the continent's reigning monarchs were related by blood. England's King George was, through his mother, a first cousin of Tsar Nicholas of Russia, and, through his father, a first cousin of Empress Alexandra. Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm was a first cousin of the German-born Alexandra and a distant cousin of Nicholas. More than was the case with the monarchies of Western Europe, Russia's Tsar personally symbolized his land and nation. Thus, the murder of the last emperor of a dynasty that had ruled Russia for three centuries not only symbolically presaged the communist mass slaughter that would claim so many Russian lives in the decades that followed, but was symbolic of the communist effort to kill the soul and spirit of Russia itself. Nicholas and his family were only the best known of countless victims of a regime that openly proclaimed its ruthless purpose. A few weeks after the massacre of the imperial family in Ekaterinburg, the Soviet newspaper of the fledgling Red Army declared, quote, Without mercy, without sparing, we will kill our enemies by the scores of hundreds. Let them be thousands. Let them drown themselves in their own blood. For the blood of Lenin and Uritsky, let there be floods of blood of the bourgeoisie, more blood, as much as possible. Unquote. Georgi Zinoviev, the Jewish Bolshevik leader who later headed the Comintern, spoke at a meeting of communists in September 1918, effectively pronouncing a death sentence on 10 million human beings. At this meeting, Zinoviev said, quote, We must carry along with us 90 million out of the 100 million of Soviet Russia's inhabitants. As for the rest, we have nothing to say to them. They must be annihilated. Much of the justification for the Bolshevik takeover of Russia was that the regime of uh, the Tsars and the Emperor Nicholas II was a repressive and backward one. 
Supposedly, the regime of Tsar Nicholas was so despotic and terrible that the Russian people uh, groaned under its despotism and rose up to overthrow it. That's not at all exactly what happened. The truth is very different. While it's true that the power of the Tsar was absolute in Imperial Russia, and that only a small minority had any significant political voice, and that the mass of the empire's citizens were peasants, it is worth noting that the Russians during the reign of Nicholas II had freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly and association, protection of private property, and free labor unions. Sworn enemies of the regime, such as Lenin, were treated with remarkable leniency. During the decades prior to the outbreak of the First World War, Russia's economy was booming. In fact, between, 19, between 1890 and 1913, the last year before the outbreak of the First World War, it was the fastest growing economy in the world. New rail lines were opened at an annual rate double that of the Soviet years. Between 1900 and 1913, Iron production in Russia increased by 58%, while coal production more than doubled. Exported Russian grain fed all of Europe. And finally, the last decades of Tsarist Russia witnessed a magnificent flowering of cultural life. Everything changed with the First World War, a catastrophe not only for Russia, but for the entire West. On the subject of the uh, role of Jews in the uh, Bolshevik takeover of Russia and the Soviet regime, it's worth recalling the role of one of the most prominent Soviet figures during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. That is the role of Ilya Ehrenberg, who was a leading Soviet propagandist during the Second World War. During the war, Ilya Ehrenberg was a leading member of the Soviet-sponsored Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. His incendiary writings certainly contributed in no small measure to the orgy of murder and rape by Soviet soldiers against German civilians. At the meetings, uh, rallies, to raise money in the United States for the Soviet war effort, two leading members of the Soviet-sponsored Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, interestingly enough, displayed bars of soap allegedly manufactured by the Germans from the corpses of murdered Jews, a story that has now been discredited, but which at one time had tremendous uh, popularity and influence in the United States. Ehrenberg is perhaps most infamous for his viciously anti-German wartime propaganda. His writings against the Germans were circulated among millions of Soviet soldiers. His articles appeared regularly in Pravda Izvestia, the Soviet military daily Krasnaya Zvezda, and in numerous leaflets distributed to troops at the front. In one leaflet, written by Ehrenberg, in t headlined Kill, he incited Soviet soldiers to treat Germans as subhuman. The final paragraph of this leaflet by Ehrenberg concludes, quote, The Germans are not human beings. From now on, the word German means to us the most terrible oath. From now on, the word German strikes us to the quick. We will not speak any more. We shall not get excited. We shall kill. If you have not killed at least one German a day, you have wasted that day. If you cannot kill your German with a bullet, kill him with your bayonet. If there is calm on your part of the front, or if you are waiting for the fighting, kill a German in the meantime. If you leave a German alive, the German will hang a Russian and rape a Russian woman. If you kill one German, kill another. There is nothing more amusing for us than a heap of German corpses. Do not count days. Do not count kilometers. Count only the number of Germans killed by you. Kill the German. That is your grandmother's request. Kill the German. That is your child's prayer. Kill the German. 
that is your motherland's loud request. Do not miss, do not let through, kill. Ehrenberg's incendiary writings certainly contributed no small measure to the origin, orgy of murder and rape uh, by Germans, uh, by Soviets against German civilians. But interestingly enough, in uh, even though his support for the Soviet state and for Stalin never wavered until he died in 1967, nonetheless, he always retained a secret loyalty uh, to his Jewish uh, roots. Even though officially he can criticize Israel and Zionism, it was revealed in 1988 that Ehrenberg had secretly arranged for the transfer of his private archives to Jerusalem's Yad Vashem library while he was still alive. The reason that this information came to light only in 1988 is that Ehrenberg agreed to transfer his archive on condition that the transfer and his will remain secret for 20 years after his death. This new revelation about one of the most influential figures of the Stalinist regime shows that whatever he may have said for public consumption, Ehrenberg never privately disavowed his ancestry or his uh, loyalty to his people. One of the uh, important um, contrasts to be made is how, uh, in our society, um, uh, Nazism and the Third Reich and Hitler are emphasized over and over, while the victims of the Soviet Union and Soviet Communism are neglected. Much of the reason for this is twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, Soviet Communism is not considered so bad because it embraced a doctrine of equality and egalitarianism in a way that National Socialism in Germany did not. And in keeping with that, the United States was the most important supporter of Soviet Communism during its most critical period, that is, during World War II. The most important military ally and political ally of the Soviet Union throughout its history was the United States, during the years 1941 to 1945, 1946. The United States not only supported Stalinist Russia uh, with military aid, but also politically. And it was during that period that the uh, United States and the Soviet Union together laid out the plans for the founding of the United Nations Organization, which was to be a structure for a new world order following the defeat of Germany and the other Axis countries.